podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to AI Scouted on Anfield Index Pro. I'm Dave Hendrick, joined as always by Mr. Carl Matchett. How are you, sir? I am as spankingly good as the Champions League ball was at the Santiago Bernabeu. That is tremendous. Tremendous. A great game last night between uh, Real and City. A decent game at the Emirates, not quite the same level, uh, but a bit more controversy. What was your view on the Bukayo Saka incident? Not a penalty. And what was your view on Gabriel picking the ball up after the goal kick had been taken to him? Did you feel like the referee was right to go, it's a schoolboy error, I'm not going to punish it? Or do you feel like once the whistle goes and the ball is live, what happens, happens? I think he's an incredibly lucky boy. Um, I mean, stupidity doesn't even come into that. Um, I mean, I think, given the magnitude of the game, that that's the right decision, but I'm not sure that I'm correct in thinking that, if you know what I mean. I I don't think it should be any different if, let's say, Notts County are playing Scunthorpe, you know? But I kind of feel like if it happened and I was playing, I know that I would be sent off for swearing at the referee. Let's put it that way. I absolutely know that if I, my team's not given that, I'm getting a red card. Yeah. But if you just take emotion out of it and look at it as a thing that happened, should that be re- really a decisive factor at the le- early end of the game? I think probably not. I think on the basis of being a human, I might side with the referee on this occasion. I thought, I, I thought it was a penalty. Because he had blown his whistle, and it was yeah. a very clear whistle. It wasn't like a thing that the players didn't hear it. They knew the game had started. Because when Gabriel picks the ball up, you can see the horror in David Reyes's face when Gabriel picks the ball up. But aside from that, I actually thought the ref had a really good game. Like I, I thought he showed that the general standard of officiating can be a lot higher than what we get in the Premier League. Yeah. Um, on the uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I think you're probably right. Like it should have been a penalty. I just want, I want the good thing to be right. If you know what I mean. But yeah, no, I, I think that's been. fair. I do think that's fair. I do think it would have added a nice bit of jeopardy to the second leg. <laughs> yeah. Um, and obviously, look, it, it helps even the draw. The draw helps us in terms of the Premier League because. Now Arsenal have to go full strength away against Bayern on Wednesday. And they have Villa, which is a really tough game this weekend. Then they get Wolves away and then Chelsea home shortly after that. So that's an intense group of games now for Arsenal. And Arteta is going to have to rest a couple of players because... The flip side of them not having had the injuries that ourselves and to a lesser extent City have dealt with is that their players have played a lot of football. And last night, it, it did sort of seem like a couple of their players were flagging physically. And I thought it was really interesting that we saw Bayern do something. The Premier League teams don't really do with Arsenal, which is attack them with real pace directly at their heart and run at Gabriel and Saliba with pace. And I thought both of them had really shaky games last night. Saliba in particular looked really, really rattled. And I think if more teams did things like that, it could cause them problems. And I'm looking at Villa this weekend and the potential of Villa playing Leon Bailey one side 
Musa Diaby, the other side, and both of them having license to cut in field, plus the pace and power of Watkins, that could be something that unnerves Arsenal if Unai Emery was watching last night, which I'm sure he was, and just takes a couple of notes. Uh, on City versus Real, though, Carl, it was kind of everything you you wanted it to be. Like, it, Real go behind early, come back, lovely, lovely finish from Rodrigo. City go back in front, but then Real show that real determination and fight that I thought they lacked last season when they played City. And the Valverde goal is an absolute stunner, as was the Phil Foden one, it should be said. Yeah, I mean, that was a, a little bit of a goal of the day competition in itself, that match. So even Gladiol's was like an unbelievable hit, even though it was yeah badness which led to the shot being able to be taken, if you like. Um, it, really good game, really weird game as well in the way that both teams went from losing to winning in the space of about three minutes. Um, I mean, both of those matches, to be honest, the, the, the European sides, let's say Bayern and Real, I thought had very similar ways of attacking in that it was really direct individual runners and like in slightly different ways and in slightly different areas. But we don't really have loads of that in the Premier League anymore. That used to probably be more mm. our way than, let's say, the overseas European League's way. It was speed and it was direct play and it was counter-attacking. But I think there's so much build-up and transition now in the Premier League that there are really, really few runners, really few dribblers. And yeah. So it was it was different for both of the Premier League teams last night to to defend against. I thought it was a really interesting aspect because that first half, Rodrigo, Vinny, and once or twice, but not quite as much, Jude did like quite a lot of damage in terms of opening up uh, City, opening up the pitch, covering like forty yards really, really quickly, and making it like three on three, three on four, quite a few times. Do you think is that the Guardiola impact on English football? 100%. The teams are teams are more control based yeah. now. Like not not just Pep because like others had been doing so beforehand, but obviously he takes things to a new level. Um, and obviously he has a lot of transition play in his game as well. But the control aspect, which is like a relatively newer thing for Liverpool, let's say we went from like an all out counter pressing sort of physicality transition monster into a much more controlled team a couple of years back, and most other Premier League teams, I think, are similar to that. They might counterattack at speed and, and press and like the turnovers can be really quick, but the actual counterattacking play is really different now. Mm. Um, so I don't really think that there's much doubt it's as a result of what the top teams have done over a few years and everyone else has done their own variation of it. Um, and again, that'll change, you know, if if the Premier League teams don't happen to win the Champions League this year, someone will try and play much similar style of attacking to Real Madrid, let's say, or whatever. That's just how football goes, you know? Uh, everyone tries and copies the team who are winning. Eventually, yeah. it'll be like, like when you look at, When you look at Arsenal, obviously, the defensive shape, the control aspect is very pep. But Arsenal counterattack very similar to how Liverpool used to counterattack. Yeah. With Saka and Martinelli as their Salah and Mane. Jesus or Havertz as that false nine link player, a power runner from midfield in Rice, similar to what we used to have with Henderson and before that Emre Chan. Yeah. And then the difference is they have an Odegaard, which we didn't quite have that kind of line breaking defense unlocking passer. Yeah. But, but, but then we had Trent, I suppose, who did that after. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know? So, I mean, look, like you said, football's a copycat kind of sport. So if if that's what's working for Premier League teams, that's what other Premier League teams will look to do. And as you said, it's just really interesting now that many of the European sides have moved back to what the Premier Leagues or moved to what the Premier League teams used to do uh, when they were having success in, say, the late, late 2000s, early 2000s in European competition. Because United used to play really direct at times, in Champions League games, especially when they had the the Rooney, Tevez, Cristiano front three. They could be really direct and go over the top to Cristiano, play into Rooney, and then they'd have Tevez buzzing around. And 
we saw a lot of it last night with, with Real in particular. Uh, but we have our own European game to focus on, which is Atalanta at Anfield on Thursday night, an 8 p.m. kickoff. Atalanta come into this game <clears throat> in poor form. They're currently sixth in Serie A, which isn't terrible, uh, but they are eight points off the Champions League spots. They do have a game in hand. They're five points behind Roma, who sit fifth. Again, they have a game in hand on them, but only one win in their last six games. Um, one in five in the league. I, this is just domestically now. They beat Napoli 3-0 on March the 30th, but before that, they'd drawn away to Milan, lost away heavily at Inter, lost at home to Bologna, drawn away to Juve. The Milan draw and the Juve draw, not bad results. Losing to Inter, not a bad result per se, but the manner of it was disappointing. But they lost to Cagliari last time out, 2-1 at the weekend, having gone one up, and they did lose to Fiorentina in the first leg of the Coppa Italia uh, semi-final. So they're not in great form, Carl. They come in in a bit of a rut at the moment, which they've had earlier this season, around November, early December, November into early December. They were in poor form, but they bounced back from that. Um, they are a capable side, but what, what do you make of them so far this year? Uh, pretty mixed. I think uh, I, I like some aspects of this team. Um, I try not to compare it too much to the Atalanta of well, probably more than a couple of years ago now, probably like four or five years ago now, uh, because they were so fun, because they were kind of new at the time. And, you know, certain aspects of their play was stuff that I really, really liked at the time. Their use of such attacking win backs who were a goal threat and all the rest of it. So this is quite a different team. Like the, the players that they have in the side now, there's a few of them who, you know, we might call together, we might call sort of put together on, you know, free transfers and players who were out of favour elsewhere and stuff like that. Whereas before they were kind of able to produce a few more signings out of nowhere, maybe. But they do still have quite a lot of intelligent players, quite a lot of players who are capable of unlocking de defences in different type of ways. I like the way that they have, uh, definitely not in the old style of using it, but a little and large front two quite mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Um, not, again, like I say, not like a, a Quinn and Phillips kind of pairing, but Skamaka and Lookman are very, very different types of forwards and they utilise that really well. Um, Teon Cook Miners as kind of a drive and runner from deep is very useful, I think, especially with like long shots and so on and so forth, gives them a bit of a different option. Um, but I do think that there's a, a little bit of a staleness about the team. I'm not, I'm not massively sold on Gasparini, I'll be honest, but kind of got to respect that he does put a team together in the way that he knows. And it's usually I'm not going to say successful, but I think it gets them to a point, his teams, um, which is usually competitive enough. Mm. Um, I think before we go wildly in depth on Atlanta, though, I would like to address the sporting game because I've already seen a few things doing the rounds and um, obviously partly to some people who maybe don't support Liverpool and just want to laugh and partly some people who should know better to be perfectly honest but they've been saying Atalanta not great season uh, managed to quite comfortably defeat Sporting in the last round Sporting of course led by Ruben Amrim who's now widely linked to be coming to us so we did briefly cover this when we went over the last round of games but I would like to reiterate that Sporting side that they beat was not the Sporting side which plays most of the time no, there were first leg a completely different team. Like lots and lots of that team was very very different, and even in the second leg, it was not a first choice uh, complete eleven. It was obviously then quite a job to try and overhaul, and they didn't. So fine. I also don't think that we should read too much into it uh, from an Amarin perspective. I was surprised he didn't go stronger. I thought he would try and do really well in the Europa League, especially if he was leaving, but. I guess Sporting place much more value on the league title, and that's fine. Um, I just don't want the narrative, let's say, to just escape that Amarim's best team couldn't beat Gasparini's somewhat rubbish a team because it's not really based in fact at all. 
I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. No, it's not based in fact at all. He made uh, six changes to the starting 11 and played one other player in a different position to where they normally play in the first leg. Uh, and they went one up through Paulinho and then Skamaka scored the equaliser and the game ended 1-1. And then in the second leg, he again made changes and you had uh, one, two, three, four five five players that wouldn't normally be starters and two of them playing in not their normal positions. So I do think anyone trying to read too much into that is just trying far too hard. And again, in that away leg, Sporting went one up through Pedro Concalves and Atalanta fought back to beat them 2-1 and beat them 3-2 on aggregate. But Amram was very clear that the league was the focus because Sporting win the league. I mean, they've they've won one league title in 22 years before this year, and he won that. He's on track to win a second. He looked at it as if I can rest players for Europe and be fully focused on the league and go and win the league, or I can focus more on Europe get through this leg and then go out in either the quarterfinal or semifinal and potentially not win the league either. So he took the bird in the hand, which was the league, rather than trying to split his his resources and compete on two fronts. He was, I think, aware enough to know that the chances of sporting winning the Europa League were minimal, given who else was left in the competition ourselves, West Ham, Leverkusen. So I think he did the smart thing personally. I, I, I just, again, I think people are trying too hard. And I've seen people say, oh, well, his record in Europe's not great. And then some idiot put up his record against English teams uh, last night. And it was, he, he had six games. They'd won one, uh, drawn four and lost one. And he was trying to make out this was a poor record. But what he was ignoring was that one of the games was a friendly against Wolves. So why he included that, I don't know. And of the others, they were against Manchester City, Arsenal and Spurs, in which he has won one, drawn three, drawn four, excuse me. He had had one win, the other Egan had one win, five draws and a defeat. Amram has a win against Spurs, a draw against Spurs, two draws against Arsenal and a draw against City and a defeat by City. So the only English team that's beaten him is Man City, who won the Premier League that year. He took four points off Spurs in a Champions League group stage. And last season, he knocked out Arsenal who were eight points clear at the top of the Premier League. And that was with a sporting team that was not competing for the Portuguese title last year. And he still knocked out Arsenal and showed their vulnerabilities. So this idea 
that he hasn't done well in Europe simply isn't true. Some years, yes, they, they've had disappointing campaigns, but other years they've had other things to focus on, like this year where he's trying to win a league title and, oh, by the way, is also in a cup final. So if he walks away from sporting with two league titles and what for him will be three cups with them on top of the cup he won in his brief spell in charge of Braga, that's an incredible CV for having managed Braga and Sporting Lisbon because Porto and Benfica are much more powerful clubs in terms of their finances, in terms of their pull, in terms of their academies. Now, Sporting have a really good academy as well, but not like Benfica's. And Porto's scouting network and Benfica's scouting network and their ability to find players are as good as most clubs in Europe. So for him to punch above his weight, not once, but twice in the league and win would be absolutely phenomenal. I, I, I'm i just not accepting that as any real criticism. Is there things you can look at and say, well, that's something he needs to work on? Yeah, sure. Sometimes, sometimes his teams overcommit going forward and can get a little bit exposed at the back. Sometimes. But then you look at the actual data and they concede among the least shots in Europe. So, you know, you also have to look at the players he has at his disposal. You know, he's using Sebastian Cuates. He's got um, Adan in goal. These aren't top-level players, but he has gotten every single bit out of them. And then he's also developed continuously high-level players that were either from their academy or brought in for very small fees, sub-10 million, and he's developing them into 50, 60, 70 million pound players. So I just think people are looking at that. It, it was an attempt to try and big up Alonso as well because certain people were just obsessed with the idea of Alonso but the thing is, their idea of Alonso and their and the reality of Alonso were different things, Carl. They were saying Alonso's the best person to come in and replace Klopp because he's Xabi Alonso, not because of the football he wants to play. And they were continuing to pick an Alonso 11 in a shape that he doesn't use and talking about them playing in a way that his team don't play. Alonso is much more from the pep school of control and at times quite boring football. Amarim, stylistically, much closer to Klopp. And also, the other knock on Amarim, oh, he's a back three manager. So was Alonso. What they wanted was they wanted Alonso to come in so he'd be the manager because they could be all warm and cuddly about it. But they wanted Alonso to come in and play Klopp football, which was never, ever going to happen. Agreed. I think there's... Um quite a few misconceptions about both the managers to be honest which have been shown over the last few weeks but perhaps uh, over the next month or so some people will be watching both of those managers perhaps with an eye on the future but maybe then again we know better not to expect that right now yeah in fairness they'll they'll just watch highlights and YouTube compilations Um, so Atalanta in the Europa League thus far uh, they Topped a group that had Sporting, had Sturm Graz, and had Rakow in it. They beat Rakow away. Sorry, they beat Rakow at home. They did beat Sporting away in the group stage. Uh, they drew away to Sturm Graz, beat Sturm Graz at home, then got Sporting again in the home game and drew that one. And then they went to Rakow and won. And then obviously, like we said, they knocked out Sporting. I it it bugged the life out of me that we got Atalanta Sporting and West Ham Freiburg in the round of 16, having already had them in the groups. I just didn't like that. I thought, you surely we should be doing the draw so that those teams can't play each other again. But it is what it is. Um, it is It is what it is. It's the Europa League, which is crap. The yes. whole setup of it. Yes, agreed. So you mentioned the fact that, obviously, this is not the team of a few years ago. And... Look, they had, a, they had a really good run. They finished fourth in 16-17. Then, to be fair, they finished seventh, which wasn't great. But then three successive third-place spots, as well as getting to the final of the Coppa Italia twice. This, in some ways, is like a golden era for them. But the fact of the matter is they won nothing. 
They finished eighth in 21-22, fifth last season and sixth this season. And it, it does feel there's some staleness to it. I think the staleness is around Gasparini. I think they're a club, not because, like, it's not that Gasparini's a bad manager, but he, he hasn't shown yet that he's capable of getting them across the line. And it just feels like he's running out of parlor tricks. They did quite a lot of business in the summer. So they had some big sales. Uh, Malinowski left to go to Marseille. Pessina went to Monza. Uh, Boga went to Nice. Hoysland obviously went to Manchester United for huge money. Uh, Yucky Mal left for Wolfsburg. Uh, Latte Lat left for Middlesbrough. And Mary Demerel went to Al Ali. And coming in, they signed Said Kalasnik, formerly of Arsenal. Uh, they overpaid for Mitchell Backer. They brought in El Balil Toure, who was very close to joining Everton. Um, has not had a good season, barely gets a game. I think he's had some injuries, but, you know, not been good. And Gianluca Scamacca was bought in <clears throat> from West Ham for big money. They also loaned in Charles de Catelier and Emile Holm, both with options to buy. And then in January, they brought in Isak Hein, a Swedish centre-back slash right-back, and Brandon Soppy arrived on... Uh, I think, sorry, he came back, didn't he? He'd been on loan. He came back. Uh, Luis Muriel was allowed to leave, uh, bringing to a close the era of that kind of famous front four, Ilicic, Papu Gomez, Muriel, and Zabata. Uh, Muriel, the last to leave there. So very much a changed group. The only players, really, that are still around, uh, Rafael Toloi, and Barat Jim City in defence. Uh, they don't. Jim City doesn't always start. Toloy regularly does. Uh, Pasolic kind of arrived at the end of that really good run. He'd been there on loan, but he's still there. Uh, Martin Darun is still there, and Hans Hattebor is still there, though not playing uh, nearly as regularly as he once did. So there has been a lot of change. But like I say, it feels like the manager's just gone a bit stale there. Yeah, I'd probably agree. Um, uh, uh, continuity is obviously a, a good thing for most teams most of the time. And I think in Italy, especially, it can be very difficult to come by. Um, but at the same time, it, I don't see huge progression at the minute with these. I think if they stay in top six, they seem to be kind of happy with that at the minute. And while that's fine and if you look at Serie A and the clubs there, that's probably also quite good overall. But given the, uh, should we say, topsy turvy nature, is that is that kind enough to describe Serie A recently? With the <laughs> inconsistencies at the top and the yeah. different reasons for people not being top. I think there's been an, an opportunity there the last couple of years, especially. I mean, even this year, like when you look at like Bologna having a really good season, they're in the top four. Um, Lazio was second last year and they're eighth this year. Napoli obviously were title winners and now they're down to seventh. I, I think that it's a missed opportunity for them, maybe. Whether you can say it's, you know, the reinvestment of Hoyland money was not done quite as well, or like you said, the manager is just a bit stale there now, whatever. I, I do think there was an opportunity to, to do a bit better, at least challenge for the top four. That eight points off Bologna. They've got a game in hand, but they've lost double the amount of fixtures that Bologna have this season. Yeah, I should point out, Toloi is the one that doesn't play regularly. Jim City plays nearly all the time. I, I got them mixed up. Um, yeah, no, I, you're, you are right. It, there has been an opportunity. There's been a lot of chaos at the top uh, of Serie A the last few years. We obviously saw Juventus dominate for a long time and then fall off a cliff. They're mediocre now, and they sit third. Um, Milan won the title a couple of years ago, then fell off. Inter haven't won the title since Conte was there. Napoli, you've referenced. Like when we see a team like Bologna spin themselves up into top four, you'd wonder how it is that Atalanta haven't been able to do a bit more. And 
look, I mean, like there's a, there is talent in this squad. Like, it's not like they're they're lacking in talent. Like, they've got two really good goalkeepers there. Karnaseki, the young Italian keeper, I'm very, very impressed with. And Juan Musso, I'm a big fan of. Now, Musso tends to be the European goalkeeper. So he's played uh, seven of the eight matches thus far in the Europa League. So I'm expecting that he starts in goal, even though Karnaseki has taken his spot in the in league games. Would you be expecting the same? I think so. It seems that they've you know, kept Musso involved. At the very least, you probably don't want to lose him. He's a wildly experienced, obviously, as, as well as being a very good goalkeeper in his time. So you've got to keep him involved. This is the competition he obviously started the season in as well as the league. So it's fine to leave him in place, I think. Yeah. In defence, then, uh, there's there's a lot of chopping and changing between domestic and European games. But a couple of players have featured regularly. So uh, Jim City, who tends to sit in the middle of that back three, I would expect to start. I think Kalasnik will start on the left side of the back three. And Ruggieri is the, the, the prominent left back, a very good young left back that's there. So I'd expect those three to be there. Now, the, the third centre back is generally Scalvini. But he's injured at the moment, so he's unlikely to play. So potentially, Toloi could play there. Um, Emil Holm can play there. He's played a little bit of right back, though I expect him to be the right wing back, either him or, or Zabacosta, and Zabacosta just isn't very good. So uh, Holm at right wing back. And then, I mean, Isaac Hein, the, 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 Swiss, or the Swedish player that came in, in in January, he could start right side centre back as well. And he has started, I think, the last two or I think two, the last two games in the Europa League for them. They do have options there, but no Scalvini is a huge blow because he is like he's a big time talent. And he's one that I'd like us to be looking at if we were looking to bring somebody in to kind of rotate with Ibu because of Ibu's injury issues and also sort of look at as a long term fit in the middle of a back three potentially. Yeah, I think he was one we referenced a couple of weeks back when we were looking at, uh, I'm not sure if it was just young players in general or under-21s or something like that around Europe who we could be looking at in sort of different lines of the pitch. Um, definitely one of the more interesting young defenders around, I think. Um, probably one of those who you can still, to an extent, make whatever kind of defender you want out of them, whether they want to be the, the main leader, let's say, or the more aggressive one, the one who steps out, or the one who's a little bit more capable of uh, reading the game really well. Um, I, th- I think he's quite an interesting player. I've not seen probably as much of him as you have this season. Atalanta were not really on my radar first half of the campaign because they were very stop-start, but watched a bit more recently and uh, definitely definitely one to keep an eye on at least. Hey guys, it's Eddie Gibbs from Anfield Index here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast and I'm sorry to call time on the show before it ends. In the current climate, it's tougher than ever before to offer podcasts for free. At Anfield Index, we produce over 75 free shows every month, which I'm confident is unparalleled in the LFC sphere. Whilst we'd love to offer everything for free, the production costs now make this impossible. That said, we don't want to follow the model of other channels and lock all of our content behind a paywall. So what we've decided to do is to continue offering every show for free, but cut that offering to 30 minutes on our longer shows. So to get all of our shows in full, and enjoy the best of everything we have to offer, we really hope you'll consider supporting the channel and signing up at AnfieldIndexPro.com. For about the price of one cup of coffee, you'll get every podcast in full with zero ads. You'll also get access to our LFC VIP community, where you can enjoy live podcasts, engage with our podcasters, and chat with other Reds in real time. So that website again, AnfieldIndexPro.com. Join today. Sports Social Podcast Network.